Well, you know those people that uh, can really press your heart buttons? <laughs> you know those ones? I've got them too. Yeah. And those ones that can really press them well, where you just want to... And I'm referring to anyone that shows up in your life where they've got that special ability to just say or do what they do. And it really rubs you up the wrong way. <laughs> it's not just the mild irritations, the ones where you're just, ah, oh, that person. Where you think you're so not like them that there's nothing in you that could ever be that person. Mm. You know those? Got a couple of examples yourself? You're definitely not like that, huh? No. And now, what about certain people that you might be aware of who might be heroes for you? You know, do you have any heroes? Who are your real role models? Those ones that you glorify, that you make larger than life. And you really admire them for a particular ability that they have. And they're so good, they're just a natural talent. And, you know, that's not you either because that's them. They're great, they're awesome. Wow, wish I could be like that. Don't know if you can think of anybody like that. Maybe you had more of those types of role models when you were a little person. But probably in life now, there's still certain individuals where you think, whew, they're amazing. I wish I could be like that. So in both cases, those ones that we really don't like and those ones that we really do like, what do you think it is in us that is recognizing those qualities in those individuals, in both cases, negative and positive? What in us is recognizing those intensely, oof, not so good states and those amazing other things in other people? Parts of ourselves that we haven't accepted? Yeah. Oh, you were looking at me making notes here this morning. <laughs> but of course, yes, this is not the first time we ever ask this type of question or explore this analogy at this type of training. Yeah? So, in ASE, at this level, we want to start exploring all aspects of our self so that nothing is ever left lurking in those dark corridors of our consciousness, waiting for these individuals to come and trigger something in ourselves just so that we can finally realize what is there in the background of awareness, just waiting for the right nudge so that we can start to finally take ownership of these aspects of ourself um, and shed light into the darkness. And so shadow work is a very common approach in various schools of psychology. Discovering the shadow self, taking ownership of that shadow aspect of ourselves, um, and in so doing, bringing it into the light so that it isn't triggered by these other individuals in our life. In other words, we're no longer attracting more of those people and situations that we don't like because we recognize that um, it's no longer such a big deal for us. And therefore, we're not inventing more of the same, attracting more of such people and situations in our life to press our buttons. And the same applies to our heroes. As long as we hail them as great and glorious, we never really step into our own power and the very potential within us that is identifying that in them, you see. So let's look at why when we project these aspects of ourselves onto others, um, that occurs. Well, firstly, there's probably people in this world who are not triggered by those characters or maybe just the worst one of the whole lot there at work, Arnold. There's probably people in the world that 
are absolutely unaffected by them. And of course, that stands to reason because they don't have to deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, the reason why we would be triggered by certain individuals and others are not triggered by them is a clue that it is something within us that is being triggered. And not everybody is triggered. So, therefore, we can't really always blame those people. Now, perhaps if we sat them over there and they behaved that way, we could get consensus from a lot of people that they're at fault and there's a problem with that. But that certainly wouldn't be empowering to us. Certainly wouldn't nurture our process of growth and evolution in life. So shadow work is the process of identifying why am I triggered by such people so that I no longer have to be triggered by them and can deal with such situations more resourcefully. This is all about emotional reactions. When we uh, are negatively affected emotionally by the behaviors of another or a certain type of person, and there might be many such in our life, who consistently trigger that particular emotion in us. And then this knee-jerk reaction involves labeling them as angry people. I have all these angry people showing up in my life. All these people that consistently treat me in, in, in a particular way. What am I doing to attract such people into my life over and over again? Okay? So that would be the type of scenario where what we're getting into now comes into play as far as healing goes. Okay? So we keep attracting into our lives certain characteristics in people now, you want to be curious. Why is that consistently coming back in your life? And here's the thing. You want to start having a good look at yourself in a very special way of seeing so that you can identify what is it in me that is like that. Not all the time, but sometimes. And sometimes it's very difficult to find that and to be brave enough to even go on the search to find that aspect of ourselves. And it's a very deep healing process to do so. And when we do find that, we then need to be brave enough to take ownership of it. It's not like we now suddenly become, let's go with the example of anger, an angry person. What we do is we discover the angry part in us that is triggered by these people. And therefore probably playing some role in attracting them into our life recurringly. So, the ASC shadow integration method is as follows. Nine relatively simple steps. Let me flesh out each one a little bit. So step one is to identify the trigger, which is the person or situation, and the situation will involve a person, at least one of them, that triggers a strong emotion inside you. One where you are reacting to something they are doing. So if they don't say or do something in a particular way, you don't get that emotion. But when they say or do a particular thing, then you have this strong emotional reaction. And as that occurs, our reaction projects that aspect of ourselves onto them. And then what do we do? We judge them as angry or whatever the case may be. And I'm going to go with angry as an example right now. Okay, so we will judge them as an angry person. And that this whole situation has arisen because of their anger. And you might feel sad or seriously disappointed or whatever the case may be, not necessarily angry in response, but whatever you feel is a strong emotional charge and you're judging them as angry. And quite often when met with anger, your reaction will indeed also be an angry reaction. Mm -hmm. But it needn't necessarily be anger. Okay? but you're judging them as an angry person in that situation. That's what happens. So that's the first thing to do. The second is to get in touch with the feeling inside yourself. 
when you are reacting and you are being impacted in that situation, what's the feeling or where is it? How do you feel it? Really get in touch with your body's reaction to the situation. There'll be a lot going on in the head, I'm sure, but we want to really locate the feeling that we're having. And if it is an emotional reaction, there definitely is a feeling somewhere in the body. It might not be one particular place in the body, it might be a whole sort of thing going on in the body. But whatever you identify, locate it, feel it, get in touch with it. Then, with your awareness focused on how your body is feeling that feeling, step three is to establish open awareness. So now you let yourself feel the feeling, and you focus on where the feeling is, but you extend your awareness beyond the feeling so that you're enveloping your whole body with awareness. And you're feeling your whole body and that particular feeling there as it is being felt within the body. Step four is to look upon the trigger situation. You'll notice the ASE happening here now. So now we go from being in a state of open awareness, enveloped in awareness, to being able to dissociate from that trigger situation. So we're not enmeshed and associated in it anymore. We pull ourselves out of it and we're able to pull ourselves out of it even if there's a strong emotion by virtue of the fact that we've entered open awareness. So open awareness isn't totally associated into it. It is present with it, but not overwhelmed by it. And when you're not overwhelmed by it, but you're present with it, it's just one step further to be able to look upon that situation. So think of ASE now resourcing, you see your whole life situation, there it is. Now I'm not suggesting that you're merging with some sort of quantum field and looking upon the world and there's your one situation happening over there, nothing quite like that, but rather just to look upon it. And the language of looking upon that situation, the prepositions of upon that enable you to dissociate, at least to some degree. And then while you're looking upon the situation, the next step is to identify the highest intention of the triggered emotion and behavior in yourself. So you go through this process of chunking up to establish the highest intention of the feeling, the emotional state that I'm having and its resulting behavior. Why am I feeling this way and why am I doing what I'm doing? And you're going to look for the highest intention. So you may need to ask yourself a few questions about that or ask your client if you're guiding them through the process. What's this feeling doing for you? And whatever the answer is, what's the intention behind that? And whatever the answer is, is and what's important about that? And any variation of your chunking up questions that's another video in the series, another module in the course, we've done that one, so you know what your chunking up questions are, until you get to the highest intention, which is where either you or your client is, is not going any further, and you'll know that it is where they're not going to go any further, because beyond that there are no words to describe it, and the one that they've reached is positively stated. Because when you chunk up high enough, and we've consistently found this, it doesn't need to be amazingly positive, but it is meaningful and is in no way associated with any type of negative value. So it will be that ultimately what they really want in the situation is harmony, or peace, or closure, or happiness, or whatever the case may be. It will be a single word. Okay, so then when we've got the highest intention, we continue. The observer identifies the most ecological way to fulfill the highest intention. So now that we know that peace is what you want in that situation, as the observer of that situation, how can you go about, in that particular context, establishing peace? Different from what you were doing before. Because we know that what you d were doing before was the result of being triggered and you've 
continue to attract that situation in your life, so what you were doing before wasn't so effective. Now, knowing that you want peace, as the observer detached from that experience, how can you go about fulfilling the intention? How else can you um, cultivate peace in that particular situation? Now, as the facilitator, you calibrate your client coming up with an ecological way in which they can do that, that they are congruent with. Ecological means it's going to serve them well, it's realistic and achievable for them, and it's not going to do any harm to anybody else, and it's certainly going to do no harm to the planet. Okay? So, they identify whatever that is, you calibrate to that's real, it's pertinent, they're congruent with it through listening to the ways in which they describe it and their physiological responses as they describe how they're going to go about maintaining peace, for example, in that situation. And then, number seven is to take back your projection, which means give that old triggered reaction a name and welcome it as part of you. This is actually a fun part of the process. The hard part is done. Okay, Taking back the projection and giving that part of you that was triggered by it a name helps you to identify with it and make it part of who you are. Okay, So, let's say that um, what got triggered was a powerful explosive reaction in me. And so, how are you going to identify it and give it an appropriate name? By exploring what was the triggered reaction and give it an appropriate name. So, a powerful explosive reaction in me is like a volcano. It's like a volcanic eruption and I'm going to call that Veronica. <laughs> Veronica the Volcano. So I welcome Veronica, and I say, here you are, Veronica, this is your place, this is your home, this is where you belong. You don't have to lurk around in the shadows of the unconscious anymore. You're welcome to be present. Now, Debbie Ford, who dedicated her work to working with shadows, and she was a personal coach who lived up until a couple of years ago, died very young, she's only a couple of years older than me. Um, wrote a, a best-selling book on this subject called Dark Side of the Light Chasers, okay, a number of years ago. And what she does is she pretends that she's a bus driver, and all the shadows, she stops and picks up at the bus stops and welcomes them on board the bus. Take your seat, there you are, all aboard, everyone welcome. Okay, you've obviously bought the ticket, <laughs> so come on, be on the bus. So Veronica gets welcomed on the bus, okay. And now you can do this exercise for all these triggered responses and welcome them on the bus. So, I don't really use the bus metaphor, but feel free, it would be most appropriate. I just welcome it as an aspect of who I am, so that should I be triggered, because this one piece of change work might not be the end all of that triggered response, but the way in which you live it is going to make the difference. Okay, so while this process might enable you to no longer be triggered and no longer react and no longer judge that person, what's going to support the process or continue the process in a constructive way would be should you be triggered in similar situations in the future and feel that powerful volcanic energy coming up. You go, ah, there's Veronica again. So immediately it's not enmeshed in the triggered response, going in unconscious mode, judging and reacting, but rather going, ah, Veronica's just come up again. Oh, Veronica, there you are. Welcome. All aboard. Here we are. So notice how that type of an attitude will enable you to just step out of the emotion and welcome it at the same time. So if it's Terra Trevor, or Panic Patrick, or whatever the case may be, you just say, ah, oh, Patrick again, Pwah. just in the nick of time, because wow, here it comes. Patrick, you're welcome. You're my friend. You're part of who I am. You belong here. This is your home. 
Patrick no longer has to kick and scream in the dark shadows in the background of your awareness. Patrick feels welcome to be and henceforth isn't needing to do what he was doing before. Okay? So we give it a name. It's a playful, light-hearted way to do something that's quite a big deal. And then because we've done something that's quite a big deal, we appreciate ourselves. Step eight is just to be and notice what's occurring in your body and have that attitude of self-appreciation, acknowledging your body and your whole self for being a tremendous vehicle for healing and transformation. And enjoy the afterglow and that attitude of gratitude and the feeling it brings and while you're in that wonderful state ask yourself what's the next smaller step? The next smaller step to stepping into this change and living it in my life.